Bonjour Bordeaux. Hi, I'm Nathaniel. I'm going to tell you about how I fell in love with PyType and why I think you should too. But it's kind of a little presumptuous of me for to, to say that because who says you're not already? So who here is already in love with PyType just as much as I am? Oh, oh, hey, all right. Um, who here is a user of PyType? Okay, and who here has heard of PyType other than about this talk? You heard about it from some other source. Okay, all right. I, uh, I have found a fantastic programming partner. And before I tell you about how that happened, I need to tell you a little bit about my background and, and my perspectives and, and what made PyType such a great partner for me. So I didn't really program as a kid. I started programming with my formal computer science education, which means that some of my first programming languages were the functional languages used in my uh, coursework, um, principally SMLNJ. Who, how many SMLNJ fans? All right. Who here has heard of Haskell? Haskell fans? All right, any Haskell fans? SMLNJ is, it's like Haskell, it's about 30% cooler. So check it out. Um, another part of my upbringing was I was raised that type systems describe the static semantics of a program in contrast to the dynamic semantics of a program. So the, the dynamic semantics are what your program means when a machine is executing it and it's interacting with a real user. Static semantics are what your program is about when it is dead on the page, when there's no machine around. And I was, I was raised early on, and, uh, and I adopted this belief for myself, that the purpose of a type system is to check for statically detectable defects and then get out of the way. So not all defects in software are statically detectable, as you probably know from computability theory, but a type system should check for all statically detectable defects and then be unavailable at runtime, so much out of the way that you can't even use it. So I write my code without any runtime type inspection. I write my code without the isInstance function. Um, I graduated from university. I went to work. I didn't get to work in functional languages. I worked in Java, but I had great success writing it as though it were SMLNJ. And when I joined Google, you know, I chose the city that I was living in. I chose the company that I wanted to work for. And I was still junior enough that I was out of choices at that point. Uh, I went where they told me, and they told me to join a Python effort. So I joined it. I had been reticent about Python at the time, but um, I really wanted to give it a chance. There were senior programmers uh, achieving good things with it. Um, there were programmers like whom I wanted to grow up to be who were having success with Python. So I thought I would give it its chance. I would, I would try to get it to work. And I was still pretty frustrated. I kept making statically detectable uh, uh, problems. I kept having none show up in places where none didn't belong. How many of you have none problems? Yeah, okay. Um, because I was still a, a learning, growing programmer, I read this book. How many of you have this book in your office, on your shelf? How many of you have cracked it open? Okay, I read this book cover to cover as a growing programmer, and there was a lot of good advice in there, but the one thing that stuck with me is, uh, is this one story from toward the back. Uh, that's not going to stay open with one hand. Good thing we have it right here. So this author uh, implemented uh, an algorithm to check their work. And it wound up, you know, each step of the algorithm was a little slow. So the, the thing wound up taking three days. And he comes back to it three days later. And the whole execution is worthless because of a statically detectable defect. So, so I kind of, you know, that story has stuck with me more than anything else from this book. I was horrified. I didn't want to grow up to, to engineer like that. I didn't, I didn't want to take that as an example, as, as the way uh, I should be working with Python. I didn't think that was acceptable at all. I was kind of scared by it. So I continued to be frustrated. How many of you keep a spreadsheet like this? Every time you're stuck in some awful debugging session and it turns out you, you, know, you didn't need to lose a whole morning, you could have just been told all the time that you can't add an integer in a list or that sort of thing. Um, 
I have this spreadsheet. How many of you think, no, 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 that time wasn't lost. That time taught me to appreciate writing comprehensive test coverage. Okay, I, <laughs> I disagree with you. Uh, we, we grow through challenge. We build character through adversity, but not all challenge is worth the character delivered. Sometimes we just suffer for no good reason. I wasn't the only one who felt that way. Enough other people felt that way that around 2012, people inside Google made the decision to say, let's develop a static type checker for Python. Um, I was working on the RPC stuff that eventually led to my working on gRPC, and the way Google sort of allocated desks, I happened to be just a few desks away from the PyType team. So we saw each other going back and forth to the kitchen and whatnot. Um, I, was, I followed their progress, but I was still pretty skeptical of it. I thought that type-checked Python was still going to be Python, which I wasn't very thrilled with at the time. Uh, it was still going to have the global interpreter lock. It was still going to have what I thought was some wrong scoping rules. And it was still going to have what I thought were a lot of problems for library maintainers. Um, but the PyType team, they didn't listen to me. They didn't, uh, they didn't accept my discouragement. Um, they benefited from Google's enormous corpus of Python code. So they knew they wanted to build a tool that would be assistive to programmers, that would help them understand where they did something wrong, but would otherwise be totally quiet. A tool that would have a very low false warning rate, false positive rate. Luckily, Google's Python uh, extends over more than half the length of the Python language itself. Uh, and just about anything that anyone's ever tried uh, you can find an example of it in Google's Python code base. So they were able to develop uh, each successive version of PyType and see where it would issue warnings, where it would find problems. PyType finally became available within Google in 2017. And it's, it's important how it became available, so I need to kind of detour a bit. How many of you are fans of the Basil build system? Okay, how many of the Basil build system? Okay, um, it turns out they're actually the same thing. They just got their pronunciation story worked out recently. Uh, it is Bazel, and if you're not a fan of the Bazel build system, they just went 1.0 a couple weeks ago, so definitely check them out. Um, when we author uh, build definitions in Bazel, we author them such that they look like this. Um, we define a library, that library has a, a a source file associated with it, and we can define other targets that depend on earlier defined targets. This is, this is probably pretty self-evident. It's, it's designed to look self-evident and be sort of self-documenting. Now, we had written build definitions like this inside Google around the time that PyType appeared, and the mechanism of action for adding PyType to your code is a little subtle. Let me, let me see if you can pick up on it. Did everybody see that? I'll, I'll dither back and forth. All right, that's, that's all it takes to add PyType to one's code. Um, and that's significant. You don't have to change the Python source file at all. I do readability reviews. Um, and I shouldn't have to tell you too much about that because I assume everybody went to Bruno's talk yesterday, right? All right. Okay, so for those that miss Bruno's talk, uh, readability reviews are a process inside Google that I'm a part of. Uh, I'm a Python expert, and I get to participate in code reviews all over Google's code base. And I ensure that the Python that is being written at Google adheres to our best practices, adheres to our style guide, is of acceptable quality. Um, I like it. I, I like it because it's a mentoring opportunity. I get to teach best practices, I get to teach Python coding as part of the process, and I also get to participate in code reviews and feel like I have improved and participated in the development of code all over Google. So I feel like I'm a part of a wide range of Google products, and that's pretty professionally satisfying. Um, when I do my readability reviews, I tend to be very, very Socratic in them. So I might look at some code and I might see a problem in a function. And then I might look at the test coverage and I might see the gap in the test coverage where the, the problem should be detected but isn't. 
And I won't go and tell the author, all right, the problem is this, and I want you to add a test that does this. That would be too easy. Uh, I like the academic defense sort of milieu of a readability review. I like asking people to explain why they made the choices that they did and, and grow through their answers to that. So I will say something like, tell me why your unit tests give you confidence that this function is correct. And, and there's a, you know, I have a lot more behind that remark than the words might indicate. When Python came, when PyType came around, uh, I would bring it into my readability reviews by saying, hey, you know, uh, in places where I thought I saw a problem that PyType would, would find, I would say, hey, have you heard of this new PyType thing? I wonder what it has to say about this code. And readability reviews, you know, they're, they're not just engineering. There's a little bit of politics in them, too. I'm an interloper, so I don't know the author, I don't know the code, I don't know the author's teammates, and I don't know their engineering priorities. I don't know their release schedules. I don't know what kind of deadline pressure they're under. Uh, and they don't know me. So I have to be pretty judicious about how much work I ask for as part of a readability review. You know, I, I do get a, a gating um, authority. I can hold up a review if I need to, but it's very, um, it makes the process better for everyone if I'm very careful not to ask for a whole lot of work. Well, when I asked for PyType to be integrated into a bit of code, it was just typing those four letters. It was just changing Py library to PyType library. Very little work, very low cost of adoption. And, uh, and when authors did this at my request, they would see that PyType caught four or five problems that they had missed, that their teammates had missed during code review, that their unit test coverage had missed, and that I had missed. Because remember, I thought I saw one problem, and I said, hey, try out PyType, and PyType comes back with three or four or five problems detected. Uh, so that was, that was a very much an aha moment. That was a moment where for a lot of authors, the light bulb kind of went on. They said, oh, this is a good thing. And it was very satisfying to watch that happen. Now, I also did my own engineering with PyType. So how many of you are users of the Chubby Lock Service? Okay, that is as expected because Chubby is an internal system at Google. Um, it's been around a long, long time. You can read about it in this white paper. We do have a public white paper about it. Now, how many of you are users of protocol buffers? Any protocol buffer? All right, all right, awesome. Um, have you ever wondered what this number two is about in your generated file? Okay, all right, there's someone who has. What the two indicates is protocol buffers Python API version two. And the reason it's version two is because there was a version one. That version one never left Google, and that's a good thing. It was a learning experience. It's bad, and two is so much better. But Chubby being an old system, Chubby, had, uh, Chubby used uh, API version one. And as part of our migration to Python three, I took on the work of migrating Chubby from protocol buffers Python API version one to version two. And this was both internal to Chubby and at the API boundary. So, as I said, Chubby's pretty old. It demonstrates how Python was authored more than 10 years in the past. So, so not up to modern standards. There were some gaps in the test coverage, and it's also a big enough system that I couldn't do this change all at once. This was a change that I had to make piece by piece, very gently and very carefully, ensuring that uh, none of, Ch of Chubby's many customers uh, were broken in any way, because Chubby's still a foundational system. A lot of code depends upon it. I added PyType coverage very early. Uh, I wound up making about 120 changes over eight months, and the work was very bursty because Chubby has an internal release cycle. So I would do some work and then have to wait for a release to go out, and that would be three weeks or four weeks or six weeks, and then I'd be unblocked and I could do the next unit of work. Well, when you're not able to focus uninterruptedly on, on work like that, when you're swapping it in and out of your, your mental attention, that makes it error prone. And I made a lot of mistakes, and PyType caught them. And I really, I really started to appreciate it there. And I also had these magic moments of finding myself thinking, if I can just get the types to check for this one small change I'm working on, if I can just get the pieces to fit together, I know it'll be correct. 
And you know, we, we all have seen a bunch of times that software engineering has a jigsaw puzzle solving as a metaphor for it. Um, solving, uh, doing this refactor without PyType and depending on runtime correctness and, and unit test uh, coverage would have been a lot like solving a jigsaw puzzle where the pieces, they, they fit together, but then you also have to look at the picture to judge whether you get a, ma a match. Um, with type checking, you could just tell by the fit of the pieces. You could just tell that if the types work out, it's correct. Now, maybe some of you, when you're solving jigsaw puzzles, maybe you want the additional challenge of having to look at the picture. But in, in a case like this, in refactoring a, a heavily used library that a lot of value depends upon, I felt like I had challenge enough. It was very satisfying to, to be in this circumstance of just saying, if I can just get it to work, if I can just get it to type check, I know it'll be correct. I don't need to look at the emergent picture. I can just feel the snap of the pieces together. Um, that was what really made me a convert. That was what really made me an evangelist and start talking about typed Python to my colleagues and other engineers. Um, now, I started to talk and think about typed Python in some interesting ways because a lot of Python programmers don't like types. A lot of Python programmers have come to Python as refugees from overly typed languages. And so I learned kind of interesting distinctions, interesting subtleties, and it turns out Python is kind of singular about engineering with types. I don't know a lot of other languages, I don't know of any other languages that have quite its approach. Um, who here is a fan of the TV show New Heart? Okay, okay. Um, it's American and it's, it's kind of old, so I'm not at all surprised. I'm a fan of the TV show New Heart, and on New Heart there are these three characters. They're brothers, their names are Larry, Daryl, and Daryl. And only Larry ever speaks, and Larry introduces them by saying, Hi, I'm Larry, this is my brother Daryl, and this is my other brother Daryl. And when I think about type engineering in Python, uh, these guys come to mind because I find myself saying, you know, this is the language's means of specifying type constraints. This is the language's tool for validating the agreement of those type constraints. And this is the language's other tool for validating the agreement of those type constraints. Now, here the analogy kind of breaks down a little bit because on the TV show, the characters were always together. In type engineering Python, uh, you can use any of these technologies in any combination or none at all. Um, let's take a look at that. Uh, we'll ignore MyPy for the moment because I don't know it too well. If you are engineering without type annotations and without PyType, that is something that until the recent past was just ordinary, was just acceptable, but today I consider it kind of rude, I consider it kind of unmannerly. So I needed something that serves as a metaphor for, for recently acceptable, but now, now just not acceptable. So that's sending a fax, that's the fax machine there. Um, you can author your Python code with type annotations, but without PyType. And this is kind of controversial. Uh, I happen to take the position that type annotations reflect your authorial intent and your authorial belief, what you want to be true for your code and what you believe to be true for your code. And having that written down in the source code is valuable. I happen to think that that's valuable and I encourage that. The other side of the conversation says, no, um, if, those, if those types aren't checked by PyType, uh, there's a high likelihood that at least some of them are going to be wrong and they're going to be misleading and they're going to be a maintenance headache later on. That's a very reasonable position. Um, it is currently the case inside Google that we allow authors to author type annotations without having them checked by PyType. That could be reversed someday. And if it were, if the other side of the conversation were to win the argument and have that policy enforced, I wouldn't fight it. I've got more important, more value delivering arguments to make elsewhere. The lower right quadrant probably doesn't surprise anyone that writing with type annotations and having those type annotations validated by PyType, that's kind of the best world. But what's really surprising is this lower left quadrant, that if you just use PyType and you're not authoring with type annotations whatsoever, 
you get enormous value because PyType is really smart. PyType infers a lot of type information that is not directly evident in the code. And PyType will find probably four-fifths or more of the problems in your code that would be found if you had type annotated everything. So this has led to a practice of incremental type Python engineering at Google. Uh, a lot of people come to us, we, we advocate PyType, and a lot of people say that, uh, we no, you know, I like it in theory, but I, um, you know, I just don't have time in my release schedule, I don't have time in my development schedule to put everything else on hold and take the days or the week or the more than a week that it would take to type annotate my whole code. And we say, whoa, 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 nobody's asking for that. Just take two or three minutes to add PyType coverage it'll probably find some issues. Just take two or three minutes, and then going forward, you don't have to make a plan to like add type annotations to all your old code. Just add type annotations in the changed areas of the code going forward, and in particular, just on the public code elements, just on your API surface, and that'll deliver the vast majority of the benefits. Um, I also happen to put type annotations on my private code elements. That's often just for my own use. That's, that's to check my own work. That's not necessarily something that has to be done. Um, we struggled for a long time in the readability organization and in Python mentoring in general at Google. We struggled for a long time to teach proper abstraction. We do believe in loose coupling between systems. We believe in systems depending on supported behavior rather than implementation behavior. Um, it turns out that types really foster this instruction. Types tend to be the natural vocabulary of supported interfaces between systems. Uh, how many of you know typing.collection, introduced in the language in, I think, 3.6? Okay, good. Um, it's an abstract class, so you'll never have an instance of typing.collection that one system passes to another. You'll have instances of subclass, but you'll never have an, an instance of the class itself. And yet, it's probably, I think, uh, the class that will appear in your type annotations, in your support guarantees between systems, more than any other class. Types tend to capture what is essential about interactions between systems. Now, it turns out that PyType shouldn't have had all these good benefits for us, because it turns out that Python was statically typed at Google the whole time. It's, this is a, an extract from our, uh, from our style guide, and it says right there, describe the type of the return value, and the same for parameters as well. So, so Python has been statically typed the whole time I've been engineering, but it turns out humans are fallible, it turns out humans are distracted, it turns out humans sometimes, you know, file down the corners. Um, it turns out that humans aren't all that great at <laughs> inferring types across multiple layers of abstraction and catching defects that are only evident across six or seven or eight layers of abstraction. So PyType, I think it's fascinating that PyType has delivered all this value just holding us to the rules to which we always wanted to hold ourselves. PyType is now expected within Google. It, we're now at the point where PyType is so successful that if someone sends you a code review that doesn't have PyType, it's a little suspicious. You're like, what are they trying to get away with? And we often make code review comments saying, um, saying if you aren't able to persuade PyType that your code is correct, don't come to me wasting my time with your arguments why your code is correct. Go get the tool to say that it doesn't see any problems in your code, and then come to me with your arguments about why your code is correct. How many of you know the software engineering principle that the earlier a defect is found, the more cheaply it is solved? Okay, I, I wanted to see every hand up. I consider this foundational software engineering. Um, I wanna, PyType plays into that. PyType definitely, uh, delivers value there in that it tells you about your defects as soon as you type them into your, into your buffer and run the tool. You don't even have to author your unit tests, let alone run them to find your defects. But I want to spin this a different way. So who here is a fan of The Simpsons? 
We'll go back to television. All right, how many of you remember this moment where Homer, Homer has run out of the house in a compromised state and Lisa shouts after him, Dad, hide your shame. Right, she's, not, she, she's got some pretty low expectations. She doesn't say stop being shameful. She doesn't say stop this shameful behavior. She says simply cover it up. Uh, I like that. It reminds me of another moment where uh, Mayor Quimby is, uh, he's toasting his nephew and in this upper class patrician way he says, may all your disgraces be private. Not, not don't be disgraceful, not like be upstanding, just he assumes that there are gonna be disgraces and he says, may they all be private. These remind me of pie type because pie type helps save embarrassment. Uh, I have tricked my colleagues into thinking that I am some kind of super programmer who never makes statically detectable defects. Um, the, only, the only party that knows that I make type mistakes is pi type. We keep it between ourselves. Uh, I get to fool the whole rest of the world into thinking I'm a much better programmer. And I want that for you. Saving time and money is nice, but I want for all your statically detectable disgraces to be private. I want you to hide your statically detectable shame. Thank you. Questions? All right, right here. Uh, the question was to persuade this gentleman that it is not more work to annotate his code than to spot defects on the way to production. I don't have a good theory-backed argument for that. I just have, uh, I, I just have the experiential anecdata of saying every time I have uh, chased down a really thorny type error, it's been on the order of hours, and authoring type annotations tends to be on the order of minutes. Um, and and the only, what tend to be the interesting places where you put type annotations are your API boundaries. Um, I don't like tools that go through a runtime profile and say these are the types that were observed at runtime, and therefore those are the types that should be in the annotations. Uh, I I prefer for uh, a software engineering reflection to be made and for an author to make a decision about this is the type that is supported, right? So I might be returning a list at runtime, but what I probably want to do is return a collection. And that way if my implementation changes and I need to return a tuple or it's better to return a set or it's better to return protocol buffers own built-in collection implementation, I have reserved for myself the freedom to do that. Those are the kinds of things that tend to take time and take mental energy when authoring type annotations, and they are worth it. They are worth it in um, the time saved having to renegotiate later on, right? Like if you accidentally promised someone a list in your API, and now you need to go and contact the maintainers of that code and renegotiate and you know, figure out how that's gonna impact both of your release schedules, that's a lot more costly than the little bit of five minutes, 10 minutes reflection of saying, I'm going to put a type annotation that is a very minimal type, a very generic type. I'm gonna reserve the future freedom for myself. Other questions? All right, I wanna thank you all for being here. It is cold, it is windy, it is miserable. We are all heroes for showing up today. I was not expecting that to be part of this talk, but but it is, and we should all feel very, very proud of ourselves. Thank you. Thank you.